Pixel art is the best, you guys, but there's a misconception that pixel art is a lazy person's art. I know that I've seen some atrocious looking pixel games out there, and if pixel art doesn't fit a game, then you'll notice it. For indie devs, it's an efficient way of making art assets which can be handy when you're by yourself and need to do programming and marketing and all the other things too. Pixel art was all the rage a few years back when there were a ton of platformers coming out and people got tired of it. Other art styles became more prevalent. I can understand that, but the games I've chosen for this video are here to show that pixel art is great and could do so much more than just induce nostalgia. There have been a lot of games that use pixels to emulate a retro style and many of them have been good fun, but since the golden days of the SNES and Genesis, pixel art has changed into something new. To get that old feel, people used older styles like having black backgrounds in Oniken to make it look like it was from the NES days. Because of the limited range of hues, a technique called dithering was used to mash two colours together to make the illusion of a third. There was even an entire game jam dedicated to using only four colours like the original Game Boy could. The number of colours that people can now use is ridiculous compared to the NES's 64 colour palette. A lot of what makes pixel art special is its focus on colour and the ability to make something with bold and varied palettes. This can create striking characters and backdrops because the colours are at the forefront of the player's attention. People are using this to add new feelings to how their games look. For instance, Super Brothers Swords and Sorcery has very muted colours to go with its dark narrative. Hyperlight Drifter creates otherworldly ruins and vegetation with bright blues, greens and pinks. Everything is all square, so you're not going to be able to get that much detail in there unless you get adventurous with colouring. I mean, there's a reason Mario had a moustache instead of a mouth. Colouring can highlight certain aspects of a design and the abstraction of small details allows the audience's focus to be drawn to specific characters and parts of the screen. Lethal League is a very fast-paced brawling game, so being able to easily keep track of your character is essential. To do this, the character colours are bright and contrasting, and while the backgrounds are still vivid, they aren't as saturated so that the players really stick out. And I mean, look at this! This is a rock! and it's blue. Why is the rock blue? Rocks aren't blue, but with pixel art it just looks good. This blocky nature of pixels means that you can't fit in that much detail, but even showing something like the main character of Hotline Miami smashing someone's head open is communicated so well that you know exactly what is going on and can be kinda grossed out by it. Another example from Super Brothers is the stone face. Its design uses the square edges to make it look like it was made from bricks, because if it was using smooth edges it would look terrible. Another style that looks good in pixels is using large flat areas of colour without much detail for a clean look. Combined with the shading, Lethal League's character design uses this for a very angular, almost 3D effect. Animation is essential to how pixel art works. I mean, obviously, I'm not sure why I pointed that out, because it would be weird if characters didn't move. Paul Veer, the artist for Vlambeer's Nuclear Throne, draws blur into his frames to make it look like there is more motion in the animation than there really is. This is an ally from Nuclear Throne. Now let's see that cute little killing machine on his own. This is the animation, and these are the animation pictures or frames. See how, when drawing the moving parts of it, the only defined line is the outline. The actual shapes too are exaggerated curves. Together this gives a cartoony quality to the character and the blurring makes it easier to put more motion into it without having to make loads more frames to go in between. Another interesting way in which people use animation tactically is to reduce the amount of frames even lower. Look at this hulking enemy from Hyperlight Drifter. In total, he has six different pictures used for this walking animation. He's a heavy character, so what they do to emphasise the fact that he has a lot of weight to him is that they spend different lengths of time in each frame. See how he quickly moves his legs and then pauses for a bit after each step as his weight hits the floor. I think he's quite cute, really. With modern effects on top of all of those things, that can create an epic looking game. These are things that were impossible with older hardware and as with all art styles, new technology has helped define how pixel games look. 
Super Time Force makes its time mechanic look like a VHS tape being rewound. Lethal League makes its characters feel powerful with effects that bend the screen and invert colours when you hit the ball. Things like lighting and the glow effects for eyes just make Hyperlight Drifter look so good. And I thought Bloom would never work well in games. So I think it's fair to say that pixel art still has a place in games and that there is more to discover and be done with the style as I've hopefully shown you here. I'm looking forward to more people using it in new and interesting ways and I think I can safely say with pixel art the rule is be there and be square. Thank you everybody for watching. All of the games mentioned can be found in the links below and if you'd like to discuss your favourite pixel art games or you have something to add, please leave a comment so we can chat about it. If you have enjoyed my video then give it a thumbs up and if you want to discover more beautiful, weird, free or wonderful indie games then subscribe for daily videos. Until next time, goodbye!